Good morning, everybody. Uh, Some of you might remember last year, we spent 11 months in the Gospel of Mark, and we left off at chapter 13. There are 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark, and we left off at chapter 13, and today we're gonna pick it back up, and we're gonna finish what we started. So not today, just today, but from now until Easter, uh, we'd be here a long time, and we do have a Super Bowl to (laughs) maybe not watch for some of you. Some of you are like, I don't care anything about the Super Bowl. Okay, great. Enjoy your hike later today. (laughs) Um, So get your Bibles out. Uh, I want to just kind of remind you, where for those of you who weren't with us last year as we started and and, kind of went through this whole series in the Gospel of Mark, I want to just kind of remind you the very first verse of the first book, of the first chapter of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, says this. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And so... For 11 months, we kind of walked through with Jesus. We, if, if you weren't here, just real quickly, we just saw that Jesus is slowly revealing himself to his disciples. Mark is the, is the shortest of the four gospels. Mark is written almost kind of like a, like a movie script. It's just like fast, it's quick, it's great for people with ADD. A lot of us love the gospel of Mark. It's, it, sh- it shows us Jesus, um, it shows us the, his teachings, his miracles, his parables, of Jesus throughout this book. And for those of you who don't remember, Jesus has 12 disciples. He had more than that, but he had 12 kind of these main disciples. And all, all throughout the first 13 chapters, he's been teaching them, he's been slowly revealing to, to them the good news about Jesus. The good news, by the way, the good news that we preach every week here at Alpine Church, the good news of the Bible is about a person, it's not about an institution, it's not about a religion, it's not even primarily about a set of beliefs, it's about a person. The good news that we have is about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Now the disciples didn't really fully understand who Jesus was. This idea of Messiah in the Old, in the Old Testament, if you were a Jewish person 2,000 years ago, and these disciples, by the way, were just average, regular Jewish guys. They weren't like the elite of the elite. They weren't the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They weren't these guys. Jesus invited regular guys to follow him. And so these regular guys would have thought what everybody else thought about the Messiah if you were Jewish 2,000 years ago. They thought that the Messiah would show up and he was gonna be like this conquering king. He was gonna be this warrior that was gonna set them free from the Romans. And so for the first 13 chapters, Jesus was revealing something a little different. Now they weren't, they're not the sharpest tools in the shed, right? So the disciples didn't, not, I mean, we're not either. Like really, let's not. I'm not trying to just throw them under the bus. I'm throwing all of us under the bus, right? Jesus calls Jesus calls regular people to follow him. In fact, only regular people can follow him. Only humble people can follow him. Only people who realize that they're not all that can follow him. Only, only, only those who recognize their brokenness at the end of the day are the ones that, that can get anything from Jesus because Jesus doesn't have anything to offer to somebody who thinks they have it all together. So if you're here today and you, and you realize that you don't have it all together, you're in the right place. That's, that's kind of where we all are. But for 13 chapters, Jesus is sort of revealing himself and he's, he's, showing, he's showing his disciples that, that he is not just, he's not just a, a good guy, he's not just like a, a Messiah figure, but that he's, he's slowly revealing that he's actually God himself. And that's one of, the, one of the things that they had a hard time understanding. That was one of the things that they had a hard time receiving about Jesus, about the Messiah. In fact, that's our question for today. Before we get into the text, if you remember, as we've studied the Gospel of Mark, we've been, for the most part, we've been asking the question that we could pull like a thread through the whole message, through the whole text for the day. Today, we're gonna cover chapter 14, verses one to 11, so we have a lot of ground to cover. But what we're gonna be asking as we go is this question, how do you, hard, how do you handle the hard sayings of Jesus? There are a lot of hard sayings of Jesus, I mean, Google it, and you can find a whole list of hard sayings of Jesus. But there are three in particular that I wanna talk about today. I wanna talk about some of his hard sayings about finances. So I wanna talk about some of his hard sayings about his divinity and some of his hard sayings about salvation. So we're gonna talk today about finances, divinity, which is like a theological thing, his divinity, and then salvation, which is kind of like a practical and a theological thing combined into one. 
So just real quick, because again, we're gonna see it in the text when we get there. Before we get there, I wanna kind of prime the pump a little bit and get you thinking about it. Like, what Jesus says about money, do you accept it? Do you believe it? You know, Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. And a lot of people, I think for Americans, that's probably the biggest hard saying, is we kind of like our money. We kind of like our lifestyle. We don't, want, we don't want God telling us how we should spend our money. Uh, years ago, one of our overseers joked that when we baptize people, we don't have them hold their wallet up out of the water. <laughs> you know, like we baptize, we baptize you, but you get to keep that unblemished. God doesn't get to touch that. Like, does God impact your finances? Does your faith impact your finances? The Bible, again, Jesus says, where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And so it's so true. Jesus actually said more about money than, 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 the, than he did about most topics. And I, I would only imagine that if he, were, if he were walking the earth today, he would say even more about money, especially here in America, because we have so much. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at Jesus' view on finances a little bit today. Or how about the second category we're gonna look at today, that Jesus claimed to be God. For some people, that's the biggest, that's your biggest hurdle. And by the way, that is a hurdle you have to get over. Because you can't, you can't believe in the Jesus of the Bible and not recognize that Jesus is God. I remember 10 years ago, Jason Doman, who is now our youth pastor, 10 years ago, he walked into this building for the very first time Checking it out, he didn't grow up in a church like this. He grew up in a church that, that taught different things about Jesus. And he heard the message 10 years ago, sitting right back there in the back row. That's where, you know, that's where people like that sit. <laughs> no, I would be back there too, I'm just kidding. But he, he's, he's listened to this message. I don't even remember what the sermon was about. It wasn't about the fact that Jesus is God, but I think I just happened to mention it along the way. Jesus is God, and it blew his mind. And he went back into the car. He didn't even bring his family this first day because a, a good husband, a good dad isn't gonna do that. He's like, I wanna make sure it's not a cult first. <laughs> I, get, I totally get that. And he calls up his wife. He says, you'll never guess. What, what? Lacey said, they said Jesus is God. She's like, wait, what? Like, God, God? He's like, yes, God, God. They said Jesus is God. And I, I remember just hearing his, him recount that story later and how that absolutely changed his whole perspective, something as simple as that, that changed his whole perspective on the Bible. And so some of you, maybe that's where you are today, is, is you're trying to understand this idea that Jesus is both fully man and fully God. Now, in the first, in the first 13 chapters, we've talked a lot about this, and we have more resources at PursueGod.org about this. But some of you are here today, and that's still the big question, the hardest question for you to wrap your mind around when it comes to Jesus is that he is God. How can that be? Or the third question really is, is related to that second question about Jesus being God. It has to do with how a person can be saved. You know that Jesus, the Bible teaches that you are saved no thanks to anything that you do. Talk about like un-American, <laughs> right? Because in America, aren't we like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my own way. I'm gonna pull myself up by the bootstraps. I'm, I mean, that's why, that's why godly people are cheering for Brock Purdy today because <laughs> he was Mr. Irrelevant. He was like the last guy in the draft. He was not like a, like he wasn't, people didn't think he would even be here today. And we're like, yes, that's an American story, right? There's something about us that, that, it's, it's, it's built into most of us where we just, we want to contribute to our salvation. Like, like we want to work for our standing with God. There's something that's very American about that. We want to work for our standing with God, and yet Jesus says, you can't do a single thing to save yourself. That's offensive to some people. That's a hard saying for some people. You can't do a single thing to save yourself. You have to trust in the work of Jesus and Jesus alone to save you. Jesus did, it, I'm a math guy, so here's the, here are the numbers. Jesus did 100% of the work. You do, that means you are left to do 0% of it. That's offensive to some people. Maybe you're here today and you're like, that's, a, that's what I don't like. 
I want, I want a religion where I get to do some of the work. Well, that's not Christianity. That's not biblical Christianity. So for some people, that's a hard saying. Like that I have to totally pin all my trust, 100% of my hope on Jesus himself, the work that Jesus did on the cross. Yes? That's what the Bible says. So how do you handle the hard sayings of Jesus? That's a question that, that will be ringing as we go through our text for today. So let's open there. Mark 14, starting in verse one. It was now two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. I'll talk about that just real quickly in a second. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were still looking for an opportunity to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. So Jesus had, at this point, Jesus was like, he had his enemies now and, and they, like, they were about ready to do what they had to do here. This was, this was literally just a couple of days before Jesus would be dying on the cross. This is the Passion Week, by the way. So at the end of this week is gonna be Good Friday and, and Jesus is gonna be hanging on the cross at the end of this week because of these leaders. They were looking for an opportunity to just get rid of him. They didn't like Jesus. Now the Passover, by the way, for those of you who don't know, Passover was a very, it was like the, the biggest, it was like Super Bowl Sunday for the Jewish people. That's what it was. It was like the biggest day of the year. It was when all the Jewish people descended, not on Las Vegas, they descended on Jerusalem. All the people, many of the Jewish people would gather in Jerusalem and they would celebrate a Passover meal together, which was a meal that was commemorating something from the Old Testament. You know that story where Moses goes into Egypt and he says to Pharaoh, let my people go. And and, and Pharaoh says, no, I won't let him go. And if you remember that story, he releases the 10 plagues. And finally, the night that they left, Moses gave this commandment to the people of Israel. He said, you need, to, you need to kill a lamb and you need to put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts. And if, and if when the angel of death comes to a door that has the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, then that angel of death will pass over that home and that home that the, the firstborn in that household would not have to die. Now, if you know the gospel message, by the way, by the way do you see the, just all of the beautiful s- symbolism? This is all stuff that is gonna happen now later. It's part of the gospel message, but of course, Moses didn't get that. And the disciples don't get it either. So Jesus is about ready to do this, have this meal that, that involves a sacrificial lamb. It involves unleavened bread, it was unleavened because the Israelites didn't have time for the leaven to work its magic and the, for the bread to rise. And so it was just basically a cracker, matzo. And this, this matzo bread was, was what they would celebrate 2000, or 2,000 years ago here with Jesus and the Passover. And all of this stuff was imbued with incredible meaning because of the story of the Israelites and, and their forebears and everything that they'd read about in the Old Testament, everything that they celebrated being Jewish people, this, was, this all had a certain meaning to them, but it was gonna be given new meaning. Next week, make sure you're here because we're gonna talk about the four cups of wine that they would, that they would drink at that Passover celebration. And we're gonna get into what those four cups were and which of the four cups was, was the wine that Jesus probably took when the thing that we commemorate with communion, we're gonna get into all those details next week. We don't have time today for it, but next week we're gonna see some more of that. So that's what's going on. This is the Super Bowl Sunday of the Jewish people and, and, and little did Jesus know that he was, he would, well, Jesus did know, but the disciples didn't fully understand what was gonna happen by the end of this week. But it says that in verse, verse two, it says the, the leader said, let's not, do, let's, not, let's not get Jesus during Passover because the people may riot. They recognize like there was a right time and a right place for putting Jesus on trial and getting rid of Jesus. It says, meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. All right, let's pause for a second. I gotta explain some stuff. Because again, you're reading this and you're not necessarily, you're not necessarily putting all these things together, but, but we, we see that there's some characters here. And it's interesting that Mark doesn't name any of the characters except for Simon, this guy who previously had leprosy. Now, it doesn't say anywhere in any of the gospels that Jesus healed this guy, but clearly he didn't have leprosy anymore. And leprosy, it turns out, is really hard to get rid of 2,000 years ago. 
And so I, I put my money on that, that Jesus had healed this guy sometime previous, even though Mark doesn't say that. That's my guess. But if we kind of put Mark 14 next to John 12, you can go read that later. John 12 is, is another gospel. John chapter 12 is, John tells this exact same story, but he gives a little bit more information. So if you read John chapter 12, what you'll see is that this woman that we're seeing in this passage is Mary, Lazarus's sister. Okay, so Lazarus is the guy that earlier Jesus had raised from the dead, and Mary is Lazarus' sister. Remember, Lazarus had two sisters, if you remember this, Mary and Martha. And Mary is the one, it turns out, who's coming and, and who's doing this thing, who's breaking open this jar and anointing Jesus. So, by the way, one other thing about that is, there's, I think there's a good chance that Simon, then, is Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' dad. Just, just for, for those of you keeping, keeping uh, track of things there. The coolest thing about this whole story, this is something that we wouldn't understand today, but I, you need to understand this. The coolest thing about this is the fact that this would have been an interruption that was considered rude. It's, it was considered rude for a, for a woman. In fact, I wanna read this from Pillar New Testament Commentary because I don't want anyone pointing fingers at me. This is, these aren't my words. This is just the truth about the culture 2,000 years ago. Let me read this. Just everybody get ready. You're not gonna like this. It says, as a rule, it was a breach of etiquette for Jewish male fellowship to be interrupted by women unless they were serving food. <laughs> hey, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I feel like you do what you want with that. Okay, I'm so totally joking. Some of you are laughing and some of you are like appalled right now. Here's the, here's the coolest thing about that. Again, I know so many people that would be so offended by that, but here's what I want, here's what I want to show you. Look, this was the culture 2,000 years ago. This was the culture. It, was just, it wasn't just Jewish culture. It was ancient culture. It was. It was ancient culture. Here's what I want you to take away from that. Jesus didn't feel that way. So many people feel like Christianity or Jesus or whatever is like, like, I don't know, toxic masculinity. Pay attention to this. Jesus did not feel that way. Jesus did not feel like he was being interrupted. Jesus loved Mary. Jesus, pay attention now in the context of this, pay attention to what Jesus is gonna say and how he's gonna talk to her because it's not the way men would have talked to a woman in that situation. It's probably not even the way some of the, some of the men watching, maybe even some of the disciples watching, it's probably not even their instinct. Watch, watch how loving Jesus is. Before we get to that, I've gotta just say one more thing about this passage before we move on, that this perfume jar was likely a family heirloom. It's hard to even, for us to even fully understand this story 2,000 years later in our culture. But you need to know that when she, when she anointed Jesus with this alabaster jar, she had to break the jar. The, the, actually, the original Greek for this, the word for this is she, when it says she broke open, the word is better translated, she smashed it. It wasn't like a screw top where you could like unscrew it, pour out some, screw it back up. She had to take that whole jar, she she, she smashed the jar to anoint Jesus. And this jar, well, as you see here in verses four and five, it says, some at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So the guys there scold, scolded her. Now, Mark doesn't tell us who scolded her, but John does. Go back to John chapter 12, and John 12 verses four says, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray Jesus, said this thing was worth a year's wages. So see, Mark leaves his name out. Mark just said, Mark, John tells us Judas is the bad guy who says, how dare you do that? Mary, you just wasted a bunch of perfume. But 
or, sorry, John tells us that it was Judas, but Mark just says some of the guys at the table. So Mark says it was probably even more than Judas, that there were a couple of the disciples who were offended by this. Now let's pause for a second. I want you to understand what's going on here and how it relates to the hard sayings of Jesus. I see, I see a couple of things here. First of all, this was a financial thing. Some of the disciples did not appreciate the, finan the financial side of this. Some of, some of them felt like this was wasteful. Some people felt like it was wasteful. I remember a story, I think I've shared it before, but a a guy at a church, not this church, another church, the pastor was sharing this story, he said, a couple came in and said, hey, this other family in our church, they're down on their luck, they, they, the husband lost the job, they've got some serious needs, and they said, we wanna, we wanna give our house to them. We wanna give our house to them. And, uh, and the pastor said, he was sharing this with a bunch of pastors, and he said he spent, his first instinct was to spend the first 10 minutes talking this couple out of that. That's the story, isn't it? And I, and I, I felt the same way. I, I would have probably talked, like, whoa, that's a little over the top. Like, how about we just take up a little, a little offering? And, and the couple was insistent. They were like, we can afford, the house is paid off. We can afford a house payment. They can't. So they did. The pastor finally relented. And that couple gave the other couple their home. That is extravagance. That's what's going on here. This is like this extravagant act that is shocking to the disciples. And again, I wanna ask you the question, are you extravagant like that toward the kingdom of heaven? Most people are extravagant toward themselves and cheap toward others. What, what Jesus teaches consistently throughout the Gospels is that we should be rich toward God and cheap toward ourselves. You do what you want with that. But that's, that's, I think that's a hard saying for some people to say that God wants me to be generous. Now, you're gonna, we're gonna have opportunities here in the next couple of months to be generous. And by the way, this campus is very generous, so thank you. But we could be even more generous. We're gonna have opportunities to be generous toward the Syracuse campus because that we're, we're, we finally are getting underway with, with building, building out that building, and it'll be awesome. We'll be in there within the next few months, but we're still a little bit short of the funds needed for it, and so this is gonna be an opportunity for us to break open our alabaster jars and be generous toward God, the kingdom of heaven. But there's, there's something else in here, because Jesus says in verse six, he said, leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. Some of you right now are like, I don't like that, Jesus. It sounds like he's kind of, he's denigrating the poor, doesn't it? It sounds like he's lowering the poor. It sounds like he's not being compassionate toward the poor. That's one way to read it. Another way to read it is to recognize that Jesus is God. Another way to recognize it is if, if they understood that Jesus was God, that Jesus was fully God, then you would understand that, that this, this is not a wasteful thing to be extravagant toward God himself. So to me, this, this touches on the second issue that, that some people have when they read the Gospels is that Jesus is worthy of this because Jesus isn't just a human, Jesus is God. The disciples said, seen this, they'd heard this, but they didn't, some of them were still having a hard time believing it. Jesus went on in verse eight, he says, she's done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. So here's the third thing. See, again, we don't understand this, but when it says that she's anointed my body for burial, there were, two, there were two precedents in the Old Testament for Jewish people, two reasons you would anoint somebody. Number one was for coronation. You would anoint somebody before they were gonna be king, like what Samuel did for David. Remember, he anointed David, and so he anointed him as king. So there's all these anointings in the, in the Old Testament. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the, all the anointings in the Old Testament are men anointing men 
And here's a woman anointing Jesus. And Jesus accepts it. He, he's not like, whoa, hey, you sh go get me some chips and salsa. <laughs> That's the Jesus we see here. He's a Jesus who's given this incredible value to women. This incredible value to women. But there's, there's a second kind of anointing for the Jewish people, and that would be the anointing at someone's burial. So you'd either be anointed as king, or you'd be anointed right before, or right, sorry, right after your death and burial. You'd be anointed with this fragrant perfume. And here's what's cool about this. Here's what I think. I think Mary was anointing Jesus as king. But look at what Jesus says. Jesus gives it a whole new definition. He says, no, she actually anointed me for my burial. I don't think she knew that. In fact, later on, as we read Mark chapter 16, after Jesus d dies and is in the tomb for three days, remember the women went to the tomb? Do you remember what they went to do? To anoint his body. But he was gone, spoiler alert. For those who don't know the story, he was gone, he was already risen, so literally this was the only anointing Jesus would have for his burial, right here. How does that relate to the question of salvation? The whole thing that, to this day, some people have a hard time wrapping their mind around is that Jesus came to die. Mary had a hard time with that, the disciples had a hard time with that. They thought Jesus came to rule, but Jesus came to die. And that goes against our perspective of the Messiah, of salvation, of all this stuff. Jesus, Jesus came to die, why? For your sins and for my sins. So that if we would put our faith in Jesus and in his work alone, then we would be saved. And some people just have a hard time with that. Some people have a hard time with a Savior who would die. Now, Jesus didn't stay dead, we know that. But some people just have a hard time with this whole message. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that for some people it just sounds like foolishness. And I think this was the turning point for Judas. I think Judas took in Jesus' teachings on money, and he didn't agree with it. I think Jews, Judas heard Jesus' teachings about his divinity and his worth, his value, and didn't agree with it. And I think finally, this is probably the, the last straw, is that Jesus, Judas took in these Jesus' teachings about his mission, that his mission would be to die. And it didn't match up with Judas and how he viewed things and how he thought it should work. And so that's why I think it says in verse 10, that Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples, went to the leading priests to arrange to betray Jesus to them. It wasn't until after all this. It wasn't until after Mary did this extravagant thing that had so much meaning, but I think underlying all that meaning, it was just, it was just making Judas wrestle with these hard sayings, and it finally brought him to a fork in the road where he's just like, nope, this isn't the guy. And so, so he made plans to betray Jesus. It says that they were de delighted when they heard why he had come, and so they promised to give him money. And so he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Come back next week, and you'll see what happens. And then the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about Judas. But to, to close today, I, I want to bring us back to one of the verses that we spent a lot of time on last year in chapter one. At the very front end of this whole thing, Jesus said this, the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. This is chapter one. This is like one of the first things Jesus said. And remember, Judas, Judas would hear this kind of language, and every time Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, Judas had in his mind what that meant. And it, by, the end, by the end of these three years, Judas is here, and it didn't line up with what he thought it should be.
It turns out the kingdom of God isn't about a king, an earthly kingdom being established to overcome the Romans. Because if it was, Jesus wouldn't have died at the hands of the Romans. It turns out the kingdom of God is a, is a spiritual kingdom. And the key to entering that kingdom is this word here that Jesus himself used, repent of your sins and believe the good news. Jesus is good news, not yours. Not your version, Jesus' version, and everything that that matters, or that, that that entails. Repentance, repentance is about turning from your way and your perspective to God's way in his perspective. It's about, it's about coming up against a hard saying of Jesus, whether it be about finances or his identity or the, the way of salvation. It's about coming to some of those hard questions. And maybe there's a hundred other hard questions that, that you still have to deal with when it comes to Jesus. But repentance is about taking your ideas and your baggage and your stuff, and it's coming to Jesus and being presented a different view of things and then saying, I'm gonna go with your view, not mine. That's repentance. Repentance is saying, this is hard for me to grasp, it's hard for me to understand A, B, C, or D, or E, or F, or whatever. I'm having a hard time understanding how this could be Jesus, but I recognize your God and I'm not and I'm gonna come your way. Repentance is, is saying to Jesus, I'm gonna come to you on your terms. I'm not gonna make you come to me on my terms. And I wanna invite you today, if, if you have your, your own hard sayings, if you have your, the, your own things that you've been wrestling with when it comes to God, I just wanna invite you to do the opposite of what Judas did. Judas came to that fork in the road and he was just like, I can't handle it. This is too much to handle and he betrayed Jesus. But 11 of those other guys, we're gonna learn next week, 11 of those other guys still followed Jesus. Now they weren't perfect and they still had their questions and they also would leave Jesus for a time. But at the end of the day, they came back to Jesus because they had a heart of repentance. And I wanna invite you to approach God with that same heart to say, Jesus, I wanna come, I wanna see it your way. I want you to help me to understand some of these hard teachings and some of these things that I'm wrestling with and I wanna just trust you and give my life to you. And I invite you to do that today. Would you bow and pray with me today? Jesus, we just wanna say thank you that you are such a, such a good God. You're such a gracious God. And God, I just, I wanna say to, to you that I've had my own times of wrestling with you, and I'm sure that there are a lot of people in here who would say the very same thing. And there might be some in here today who are wrestling. There's, a, there's like a battle even for their soul going on, even right now. And Jesus, I pray that you would get through to those hearts. God, may we have a heart of repentance. May we come to you and say, you're God, I'm not. Even if it's hard to understand, I wanna go your way. God, may we receive who you are and everything that means to us today. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.